There's this thing that we say in Hawaii called top story. And it's when friends and family gather around and you just talk for hours and hours and hours about things that happened in the past. I was one of the few Asian Americans whose great, great, great grandparents were the ones who immigrated. I feel like I am constantly trying to find those connections. Growing up, so many people would stop me and tell me how much I looked like Violet. She had these cupid bow lips and her eyes were gorgeous. Her eyebrows were so expressive. Violet Wong was an immigrant. She was the star of the first Asian American film and she was my great grandmother. The Teresa Guangguan is a film that was written and produced by my great great aunt Marion. The Curse of Guangguan is one of the greatest unsung master stories of silent cinema and that it was made by a woman who was barely 20 years old with no formal training, no film school, no prior experience, uh, but with just such an innate, excellent sense of story. It blows my mind. She played the villainess, she raised the money, she had family and community support. Everyone in the entire Wong family was involved in some respect whether it was making costumes and sets or, you know, securing finance. There were three generations of Asian American women from my family just acting alone, not even including all the people working backstage. Marion was bold. Marion didn't stay in the confines of what the youngest daughter of a Chinese American household was expected to be. She was a trailblazer. Marion grew up in Oakland, California. The emerging movie industry was around her. The Orpheum Theater, Paramount, Fox, all developed in that neighborhood. They would have, you know, the Nickelodeon machines. They would pop a nickel in and see uh, short movies. Women were making films about themselves for other women all throughout the early silent era. Tons of these heroic shorts about female action heroes. And it was films like this that Marion Wong would have been seeing in the early 1910s up until the year 1920 when there was what I call a soft purging of female influence from Hollywood. The Curse of Guangguan gets made in 1916. Uh, in 1917, Marion and her mother Chin Si took the film, uh, its, its original full five reels, to New York on the train uh, to meet with distributors. But it was rejected. And then after that, World War I hit. And as we all know too well today, a pandemic hit and in the process of editing down a more streamlined version to meet their demands, she gave up. The family kept quiet about the film afterwards. Over time, people throw things away, unfortunately, things get damaged. We were missing several reels. We didn't have the original dialogue of the film. Our family was embarrassed and ashamed that it was a failure. The film went largely ignored and unappreciated because the surviving footage lacked preserved intertitles. And for decades, the plot was believed to be permanently lost. In June 1968, my great grandmother, Violet, took my dad to her basement and she pointed to a corner and there was this brown container just placed next to a water heater. And she told my dad, you do something with this. And he took these reels and he converted them to 16 millimeter. And these two versions were merged in 2004 by the Motion Picture Academy and digitized to what we have today. 
I remember the first time that my husband John and I watched The Curse of Gwangun that immediately as the credits began to roll, the first thing he said was, Well, that was baffling. I had no idea what it all meant. But I was thinking one day, isn't it strange, isn't it a lucky coincidence that the title card is preserved that says the name of the film, that every major plot point in the surviving footage is there? The golden key to cracking this code was through a thing called the lexicon of gestures. In silent film, actors use their entire bodies to express uh, emotions or even plot points. When I would watch the film, I would pay very careful attention to the gestures, knowing and understanding that they were a preservation of the lost plot. I've watched each, each segment, each scene of it probably hundreds of times, practically frame by frame, breaking down the film into the most essential building blocks of human motivations. The hair scene is a great example where, you know, she's fighting with the servant girl about how she's supposed to do her hair for a very important and traditional tea ceremony. But Violet prevails and she gets to keep her bangs. That character is so American that she pushes back against what the family wants her to do. The plot descriptions that we inherit from the 1910s newspaper clippings are intentionally misleading. This isn't about a Chinese god punishing a family for becoming too westernized. What the film is really about is trying to understand Chinese culture, but also being so American that you don't know where to start. Our goal here is to return what has been stolen to give back the truth, to set the narrative straight. How lucky are we to connect with our relatives who are long gone through cinema? I never met them, but I got to experience their youthful energy as if they had never left. Marion Wong was going through many of the same identity crises that I am as an Asian American woman. I do feel a responsibility to carry on this story and continue protecting it, uh, I think that's been passed to me.